Okay. The Visiting Artist Program funded by PAPA's graduate program brings in outstanding rosters of local, national, and international artists to PAPA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. The program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion about contemporary art and ideas. This evening, we are pleased to have Eileen Neff joining us. Eileen Neff, having formally studied literature and receiving her BA from Temple University, her BFA in painting from the Philadelphia College of Art, and her MFA from Tyler School of Art, has been working with photo-based images and installations since 1981. She is a resident critic here with us in the MFA program at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Her work is currently featured in the Philadelphia Museum of Art exhibition, New Grit, Art in Philly Now, as well as in Karmic Joy at the Bridget Mayer Gallery, who she is currently represented by. Eileen has been the recipient of several awards, including the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Memorial Fellowship, Pew Fellowship in the Arts, and among many more. She has also been awarded many prestigious residencies. From 1989 to 2002, Eileen wrote reviews for Art Forum International and continues to write independently to this day. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Eileen. You may now begin sharing your screen. Thank you, Marley. You're welcome. And thank you, Christy, and thank you, Lily. Hi, Lily. I'm going to share. Let's see if this works. Here we go. Um, All good. We good? Yep. Okay. Um, it's great to be here, and it, uh, of course, has been great to be bumping into some old friends and meeting some new ones. And um, I don't know if Kevin is here, but I'm grateful to him, of course, for inviting me. Um, my presentation today has its own introduction, but I'd like to begin by introducing the introduction to you. I originally prepared the core of this presentation last November for my graduate seminar here at PAFA when I thought to describe what it was like being in the studio during the pandemic. And really, it developed into what felt like a general model for one way to stay close to your studio practice during difficult times. And everyone knows that there are all sorts of difficult times, even without the pandemic, although we also know none quite like it. So when I first told Kevin about this idea, we agreed that it would still have some value, and I hope that's true. And of course, I've added on to the story as first told, as the story has grown and changed quite a bit since last November. But all of this is to explain that when I originally titled this talk, Suddenly Last Spring, I was referring to the spring of 2020 and the beginning of the pandemic. So that's the introduction to my introduction. And now to begin again with a short account of how I responded to the pandemic in my studio and how that's continued to unfold. <clears throat> so I've called this slideshow, my mouse isn't working. <laughs> that's not what I call the slideshow. That's so strange. Okay. Hmm. Um, uh, so I've called this slideshow suddenly last spring. When I thought of that as a title, I remembered the movie called Suddenly Last Summer, a Southern Gothic mystery film based on a 1958 Tennessee Williams play of the same name that, to quote some movie blurb, takes Williams' idea of repressed sexuality to the extreme with a faceless gay villain who uses his female relatives as bait to lure men and gets gobbled up by an angry Spanish mob as punishment. That's Elizabeth Taylor. In the story, Elizabeth Taylor played her, her lobotomized so she won't remember a family secret. None of this has anything to do with the work I'm about to show you, but it was such a good title. I remembered it from my youth suddenly last sum summer, only it came out suddenly last spring when I started reflecting on what happened last March, when suddenly it was clear that we were in a pandemic and among other things that I wouldn't be going out very much and nothing would be quite the same for a long while. Before that, the world wasn't all all right either, but it was possible to think it was rosy enough 
if just off and on during the day. But after, after was quite different. So what's a girl to do? I still needed my dose of nature, if only in symbolic form. And the good news was that I live and work in the same space, so I didn't have to worry about getting to the studio. I was already there. And another bit of good news, and one is always looking for the good news, especially in bad times. The really good news for me was the time of the year and the approaching summer solstice when the sun moves further north and north enough so that its light toward the end of the day as it's setting in the west appears on my eastern walls. I've been marking this gift of an appearance for several years by putting images in its path to photograph its moving effects. Here's my eastern wall with a photograph of the late spring sun moving across an image from a Kentucky forest and a few minutes later that same afternoon. And then the series that developed from the Pennsylvania sun setting on these Kentucky woods. I think of these as a kind of border crossing an unlikely confluence of time and place that I become witness to and then can capture in these photographs. It's a concept and a title that I've returned to recently, but we'll get to that later. In this version of paying attention to the special guests from 2016, I made a series of five, which became a repeated format. Then after a trip to the Shenandoah Valley in 2017, I made a large print of this Virginia landscape to place on my Eastern wall for a similar purpose. And then the five changes of light and time, this time without the pillars of light at the tops. And then again, this is PA over VA, Pennsylvania over Virginia, number two, and PA over VA, number four. I'm giving you a short tour of the recent history of the setting sun moving across my studio wall. And just to prove to myself that I didn't have to go far to get lost in the woods, this is the Pennsylvania sun setting on a Pennsylvania landscape from Fairmount Park. And in an updated footnote, I'll come back to this image in the sun's path, one version of which was recently produced for a current exhibition at the Bridget Mayer Gallery, but also to show that other kinds of subjects were considered. Here's the real sun sitting on some fake trees, sitting on a real shelf called, of all things, sun setting. Then suddenly last spring sprang on me, and here comes the sun again. I had to make it louder. Pardon? It's always up on the bottom right. Mm -mm. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought someone was talking to me. Well, um, then suddenly last spring sprang on me and I thought I wanted another shelf, not like the last shelf, but I didn't have the one I wanted. So I went online. Where else do you go during quarantine or ever and found an image of the shelf I wanted and did a screen capture and made a print of it. And that's what's on this wall, my small printed image of a shelf sitting on top of another piece of paper, and then the sun, etc. At some point, I knew I had to walk outside, and the locust trees on my block had dropped a few fresh leaves, and when I brought one back to my studio, I placed it on the photograph of the shelf, this time late in the day when the light was all rosy again. And here, with the stripes of light that the windows help shape, and then I placed a pin on the paper to make its real shadow fall as it sat on the photograph of the shelf, my very minimal sundial of sorts. Then I shifted the direction of possible interventions when I realized I could block some of the sun and make it appear as if the sunlight itself was sitting on the shelf. This is a more confounding image that captures both the sun on my walls on the left, as well as the windows the sun is passing through, reflected in the plastic covered canvas leaning against that same wall on the right. And at some point, I turned away from the wall and toward the windows themselves, 
which had made the bands of light on the wall and a whole other kind of work evolved when I, cons when I considered the sky's light toward the end of the day and how it was framed by the windows. This is called both sides. One side is screened and one isn't. And with the window slightly open, I called this waving goodbye. And then some extended light effects when I shot the windows at an angle then straighten them out later in Photoshop. And here's a direct sunsetting kind of sky with the grid of the screen close up. And looking past the frames of the windows, there were fireworks or at least this one firework. And sometimes the sun setting on the river was just enough. Then other times the skyscapes became backdrops when I felt the need to animate the situation. This is called Will and You, a title I thought of after an email exchange with an old friend, a former PAFIS student you might know, Johnny Chase, who's married to Will. The leaves were cold from a 2015 installation after a residency in Costa Rica, recycling happening in all kinds of ways. And again, in mountain seeing, when the clouds get awfully mountain-like, expanding my sense of experiencing the natural world from my 29th floor studio. In retrospect, I see this image as a kind of self-portrait of the artist looking out over it all. And I'm reminded of a much earlier self-portrait called bird watching. We move along, but we circle around endlessly, it sometimes seems. And back to the current windows, this time using them like a wall on which I constructed this collaged image titled Picture Window. This is a direction I'm still exploring, though truthfully, I revisit all of these possibilities often, and I'm just showing an edited version of a few recent and ongoing thoughts. Then turning to the actual walls of the studio with my back to the windows, I thought about what was really already hanging on my walls, my printed to scale taped together test prints for work I was already planning for this year's new grid exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. These are tests for blue jays looking at blue. And from this image, I created blue as a window when I photographed the blue panel at an angle, enhancing the window-like appearance as I still had windows on my mind. And in this new sequestered world, my taped images, which I had been living with long before the pandemic, and which had always been interesting to me, now held my attention in a heightened way. I call this group work from work. The fractured images made of barely held together pieces of printed paper seem more compelling during the pandemic more like the way things felt. They hadn't changed, but everything else had, and I was seeing them with different eyes. And this already made repurposed sky turned window and blue as a window encouraged me to create another taped up image, this time for the purpose of re-photographing, taking my new attention to my tape maquettes to heart. This is called Such a Rainy Day a cleared out sky shot through the raindrops left on my window after a storm. <clears throat> and in this image called curtains, I've used the tape not to hold together different photographs, but as an element of the drawing within the image, another direction entirely. Then a couple of more intentionally constructed pieces a large sky image that I had a friend print for me so I could drape it over my real fake hedge and call it falls. And then hedging, an image of the hedge draped over itself. I should say that this hedge just didn't happen to be hanging around my studio. It was waiting for this spring, spring 2021, when it would make its formal appearance in the inaugural exhibition of the new Frank Geary galleries at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, New Grit, Art and Philly Now. 
Last November, I couldn't let more than the tops of the hedge sneak into my work as I was preparing it for its PMA debut. Shown here in an installation shot of the hedge in place before a photographic image of a window from one of the period rooms at the museum. This is the work I call border crossing. I should say that I have been photographing the period rooms for a couple of years with periodic visits to the period rooms, being very smitten with the discovery that the walls and windows of the museum were visible right behind the constructed windows of the constructed rooms. The backstory was there for the telling, for the seeing, along with the main plot. And I've always been attracted to that moment when the artifice, which of is of course everywhere in the museum, announces itself for what it is. And of course, I'm drawn to windows. And here's my tape together model to scale version, having been removed from the wall and resting on my sofa. It's another example of my heightened attention to the accidental pleasures one encounters in the studio. The images discovered on the way to becoming the desired images. Then back at the museum with the final version. And on either side is the hedge in its box titled, The Hedge Was in a Box. As it first arrived in my studio and asked to be photographed before being removed. This is a close up of one. But for the whole pandemic year, it was just a hedge in waiting and impossible to ignore and here again in the work I called hedging. But now back in the studio with another work, another work from work image. This is called Man in Blue Looking. It's a large to scale section of an even larger work that was another image in waiting like the hedge all waiting and anticipating the PMA exhibition on view now. And here's man in blue looking, all grown up, flipped horizontally, and documented at the PMA where it's in temporary residence. I'll show you a couple of more images of the PMA installation before telling you some more backstory for man in blue looking. <clears throat> I should say that the invitation to exhibit my work at the PMA um, was included um, the invitation to collaborate on the installation with Micah Danges, whose work you see here, the large mesh panel and one of his small dark works with mine. There's a second large mesh image of Micah's, not pictured, but identified here in the maquette I had built for us to consider the placement of our works. The curators knew we were both very interested in installation considerations and allowed us to config configure our individual works together for a unique collaboration within the larger exhibition. And we were both very grateful for that. And that second large piece of Micah's was from the beginning, the only real variable in the arrangement winding up off to the side of our space. I even found a mini real fake hedge for my mini period room window. And the small image meant to be at the ceiling of the space was already in place called the bird is in a tree and seen here back in the actual space, high on the wall where it meets the ceiling. As you saw in the maquette, I always intended it to be there, but I wasn't expecting the ventilation slit between the wall and the ceiling and had to try a to scale model at the museum to make sure it still worked, then decided it did. For me, it was uh, not only another nod to the layer encountered of ideas about representation present everywhere with the slight shadow of the fake bird standing on top of a photograph of some trees. It was also an acknowledgement of our actual presence in the physical situation we were in that the viewer would be in viewing these images. And in that sense, related to the more oblique reference to the period rooms at the museum in the window of border crossing and the mirroring of our presence implied with all of the looking going on in man in blue looking, not to mention what the Blue Jays were up to. And in this image on the far right, you can see Blue Jays looking at blue 
in its formal presentation at the museum. And you can recall the version you saw earlier where the blue taped together section became blue as a window, et cetera, work from work, and how the pandemic showed up in my studio. Here I want to return to the studio once more and give you some backstory, a more extensive history for Man in Blue Looking. I said that it was an image in waiting for the PMA show shown here, but that was only after its originally intended home was no longer in its future. The image comes, comes from a very different project that began a few years ago when I visited the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia and learned that they were about to open and clean two of the originally sealed dioramas from the 1930s, the dioramas for the Takin and for the gorilla. And here's an image mid project of the Takin diorama with a wooden platform built for the workers to stand on. I hope you can appreciate how seductive this image was for me with a platform position before the painting of the landscape. That mix up of the actual with the artificial having a special pull on me. And you might recognize this landscape painting as it's the same one as in Man in Blue Looking, just another moment in the renovation. And here are the talking, in case you're not familiar with them, the Christmas lights uh, being my own addition for a holiday card one year. The taxiderm creatures were taken away, sent to their own cleaners during the process. And I'm assuming you're familiar with the gorilla, but I wanted to show you another example of the kind of unexpected but powerfully suggested images that I kept encountering during the project. And the reason that I wound up photographing this endeavor for about nine months, a very unlikely activity for me, not being a documentary kind of photographer, but it grew into a project of such duration because such surprises were always waiting for me as it developed in a way I never could have imagined. By the beginning of 2020, and right before the time I'm addressing in this presentation, I was hoping that the very expansive project I was calling a room within a room of her own would make its appearance at both the Academy of Natural Sciences and at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, a double installation that I had proposed. I had had all of the curators and the mu museum directors of both institutions visit my studio with great enthusiasm and more than once. But just as we were getting ready to confirm some shared dates, it was suddenly last spring and everything changed for everyone and in very particular ways for museums, especially for PAFA. And there was no way that it would be possible, I was told, to book something new at that time, as so much was uncertain and all that was already on the books would need so much extra attention and unknown amounts of time. This was hugely disappointing news for me as I had invested so much of my time and thought into the project and really believed in it and I still do. But I had to put it away, make room for what else wanted to come needed to clear my walls as well as my headspace, and so I did. I want to show you, whoops, there we go, um, two digital maquettes that were the beginning of my double museum proposal, two maquettes that I had begun building both digitally and actually to some degree before the plug on the project was pulled. These were part of my original proposal to the two museums. This is a view of the one for the gorilla, and you can see the ghost of his image on the plastic hanging from the maquette, as well as his permanently raised arm in the photograph on the wall under a portrait of one of the Academy's founders. And two early views of the talk in maquette. I wanted to show you these for a couple of reasons. One is that as lucky as I've been, things don't always go your way, but what you do with the changes that you can control remains in your hands and makes all the difference. 
And aside from repurposing man in blue looking and thinking of it, whoops, that is so strange, it's not moving. Whoa. Something strange is happening. <laughs> um, it says that my screen share has paused. How did I do that? Maybe unshare and then share again. Okay, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> Only my mouse isn't behaving. This is not supposed to happen. This is one of the things, whoops, wait. Okay. Well, this is interesting. Okay, did I unshare? Yep, you're unshared. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Oops, there we go. All right. Louise, what was that? <laughs> um, okay, where am I? Um, Oh, man in blue looking. Okay, aside from repurposing man in blue looking and thinking of it now with all of its layered artifice and the new meaning of the hazmat suited man, dressed so because of the toxic fumes and the open dioramas left over from the arsenic used to preserve the creatures. Now this protected man suggested another meaning in the time of COVID and his concentrated looking and the casting of his shadow on the painting of the landscape inside of the photograph, all of these things encourage me to think he could be plucked from his origin story of the talk and diorama and have a meaningful life at the PMA, that great site of intense looking. With the diorama project put on hold, the maquettes themselves needed dismantling. And in that process, they started talking to me in other ways. And I began creating some new constructions outside of the frame of the diorama stories. And another opening up became possible as long as I was paying attention. This is called Home for Ranunculus, that flower image on the right, an older image of mine. And this new work is a recollaged and rephotographed compilation of parts, um, which is now a flat image and one that is not bound by the rectangle, but cut out, cut out along its edges. And another, um, my father's house, a variation of the dismantled materials with some new ones added. And in this untitled reduction of the elements. Um, so I'm showing you a few examples of where this necessary dismantling has led. And then one more turn back to the studio for another unexpected outcome of ongoing work that I referred to earlier. This example from the series of the Pennsylvania Sun setting on the Pennsylvania woods was recently put into production when the gallery I've been affiliated with, the Bridget Mayer Gallery, decided a couple of months ago to reopen its doors after being closed for five years. The reopening group show featuring its gallery artists was to be called Karmic Joy, a title I needed to respond to. So somehow <clears throat> I turned to my yearly solstice visitor produced images, this one in particular from PA over VA and created this small installation, which I've called Pale Blue Dot. I knew there must be birds in there somewhere, uh, though they're not visible. So I inserted these two for the occasion of the exhibition, placed them in a cropped close-up, and seeing that one was apparently talking to the other, I extended the joy of the moment by recalling some exalted thoughts of Carl Sagan, the planetary scientist, when he saw the earth from a photograph taken from outer space, nearly 4 billion miles from our planet and called what he saw a pale blue dot 
the title I've borrowed for my installation. You can barely see it on the band of light on the right near the center. I don't know if that's visible to you. And here I'd like to read just the very beginning of what Sagan wrote upon seeing this image of the earth. Look again at that dot. <clears throat> that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And with that, I decided to let the talking titmouse in on it, as if the birds too might be mar marveling, as Sagan did, at the elation and the humility of the moment, at the wonder of it all. And this is where I'm going to end. So thank you for your attention. Sorry for my little glitch. Thank you, Eileen. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any, and if I can answer them. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody has um, any questions, go ahead and take this time to put them in the chat and I will read them to Eileen. Let's see if I have any already. I have a comment and a question so far. Um, I have a comment from Dory. She said, painting with light. And then I have a question from Christine. She said, Eileen, I'm delighted by your curiosity about the layers of artifice we engage in daily in daily and how you play with revealing the layers to your viewers. When you were young as a child, did you create physical dioramas? The staged insulation diorama format seems a natural format for you and how you inspect the layers of your world. Uh, well, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't make dioramas, I, I drew a lot. Um, but I had visited the dioramas that I got involved with as a child. My dad had taken me there. And when I went back, um, this time, uh, uh, an, another image of mine, um, not related to the project, um, but from my trip to the Shenandoah Valley, um, was very diorama-like to me. And it made me recall the dioramas at the museum, which is two blocks from where I live, and I decided to visit. And that's when I learned about um, the uh, renovation that was in the works and about to happen, et cetera. So it was all kind of serendipity of just following, you know, the lead of the work really. And um, that's how that all came to be. Um, I should say that my dad also made things. Um, it, he, he wasn't um, an artist uh, officially. I always thought of him as an outsider artist because um, he had no patience for um, watching television and uh, what the other adults were doing after a day at work and would spend time in his shop um, uh, making all sorts of things and uh, including uh, a replication of all of his tools out of wood. He made them all out of wood, which I now have in my studio. So I, you know, there, there were um, inklings of uh, making and building and creating, but uh, I didn't make dioramas. Not that I can remember, maybe I did. 
but I, I have no memory of that. Thank you, Eileen. I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, but Omid says, incredible works, Eileen. MB says, tell me about your relationship with Madrid. Magritte? Yes. H who said that? MB. MD? MB. I'm not sure the full. Oh, okay. So M Magritte is, you know, someone in my pocket. I, you know, I, I don't know if you already have artists or other creative minds in your pockets yet, but you know, they're the ones that you don't necessarily think about every day, but they're in there. They have uh, made an impact and that's ongoing. So um, Magritte was certainly one of them. Um, I always thought he was distinguished among the surrealists, many of which I was not interested in. Um, I think I was more interested in the literary aspects of surrealism than the visual. Um, there are other exceptions. I'm thinking now Max Ernst, et cetera. But um, Magritte, I always thought was um, a poet of the mind in a way that I um, could relate to. And he had a certain um, remove or uh, distance and playfulness and yet intelligence and all of those kinds of things that um, were very seductive to me. So I've read many books on him and one in particular for anyone else who's interested um, in Magritte, the Susie Gablick book was particularly fascinating to me. And she had a lot of his writing, which also interested me quite a bit. And um, I don't know if that answers it. I, th I think I could say a little further that um, his attachment um, to the ordinary and, and um, his capacity to find the extraordinary in the ordinary is something that I have a great spot for. And that was another, uh, I think, affirmation of um, my connection to him. Of course, it always twisted, but sometimes with his work, you had to look twice. And that kind of thinking something's familiar, but then if you keep looking, which I also value, um, you recognize that it could never be that way, except as an act of the imagination. And that was, that was very compelling for me. So for all those reasons, he takes up a very large space in one of my pockets, even though I don't have any pockets on me right now. Thanks, Eileen. I have a comment from Kevin. He said, thank you, Eileen, not only for the amazing talk and insight into your process, but also for all that you have offered our students over the years. I really appreciate your focus on how you repurposed elements of projects given the pandemic and how you allow for connections to emerge organically. Lastly, but not lastly, I really appreciate your language play and how it accompanies the visual play that you implement in your work. Sorry for the long comment. I'm used to talking. Thanks for all your efforts, VA people. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for the long comment. It was, per it was perfectly long. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I was hoping you were, and I'm grateful that you invited me in the first place. And it was kind of fun, this um, presentation, which went elsewhere and started, like I said, last November, to, to really revisit and see what happened since then since everything was sort of hovering then. And, you know, so much has uh, unfolded and even come up since then that I didn't even know about, like Bridget Mayer reopening the gallery, et cetera. So yeah, it's been, it's been a very crazy time. I know it's been that way for everyone, um, but, you know, work, work is the, the thing you can count on. And I, and I, without having said that along the way, I, I hope that is um, part of what um, the students can, can leave with. Beautiful. All right, next is Amy. 
Um, they said, love your work. It is very inviting to the viewer and precise too. Do you edit your photos a lot or as minimal as possible? Um, well, I have a very um, um, modest relationship with Photoshop and I'm not being modest in saying that, it's true. Um, I resisted um, having my work become digital for the longest time. And I originally, when I got involved with photography, it was cut and paste and then reshoot, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, it was pointed out to me that I could do that um, digitally. And that's sort of what I do. Uh, I even resisted using a direct photograph just taken for a very long time because I always thought I had to intervene. And so that was another milestone. Um, so I forget the question. Uh, do I do I do a lot of editing? I would say no. I do a minimal amount. I I there's so many bells and whistles these days. I mean, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I always think about it, but lately because um, I'm actually planning another exhibition for November, a solo exhibition at Bridget Mayer. And that's a whole other world of trouble for many other reasons. Uh, but I mean, it's all good trouble. But um, I, I've just been thinking about um, this notion of bells and whistles and, and the, the idea of, uh, uh, and being aware that so much work now comes comes with it. And my naturally ornery reaction to things around me um, wants to respond in a more direct way. So, um, and that's, I think, related to your question about um, editing. So it, it's all, yeah, it's all these things are kind of on my mind at the moment. But the, the more direct answer is I, I don't do a lot of editing. Oh, and I should say, I forget who it was. I think it was Lewis uh, mentioned that he had seen this image that's on the screen and, um, and commented that he thought I added the light in Photoshop. Um, I, think, I think I'm getting this right, it was just this afternoon. And um, and this is, you know, this is a found image, you know, in my studio. I hope you understand. This is the sun setting on a large photograph that I had um, on that wall that I showed you. So, you know, a, a kind of in a way, there's a performative aspect to it where I'm, you know, I only have this piece of time and I'm sort of, you know, on the other side of June 21st and the solstice and there's less sun now, unbelievably, because time is such a bandit. Um, but I'm, um, you know, I have this little piece of time when the sun is there and the question is like, what can I do with it? And, um, and, and this is, a, you know, a, of course, an example, but again, not in an edited uh, image at all. Beautiful. Um, our next question is from Sally. They said, how do you choose the substrate for installations that your prints are created on? And what is it, metal or paper? Um, well, it's a, a few different uh, materials um, and some, some of it's metal and some of it's paper. <laughs> and I've been, you know, I, 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 initially I did a lot with plexi-faced images. Uh, but there was always the reflection that had to be dealt with. And sometimes I didn't mind and other times I did. And occasionally I want that still. And for the right image, I will do that. Um, and that could be something printed on paper or on metal really. Um, so it, it varies, it goes um, you know, back and forth according to um, how I want the image to look. But this is directly on um, dye bond and it's a very, you know, it's a aluminum uh, compound uh, composite and um, it's very, very matte. And I seem to really like that at the moment. 
But um, but that's always, you know, that's like an ongoing question materially. Although I must say, compared to a lot of other artists I know, I'm not I, materially driven. I was even struck working with Micah at the museum. He's, he's so materially driven. I mean, he's very conceptual and idea oriented, et cetera, but materials are so important to him. And I think um, maybe again, back to McGree as you know, a, a visual artist means something to me, although I probably pay more attention to poets. Um, he, you know, he, he's, he's very um, driven, ideas are often driven by the materials that they turn up on. That's not really the case for me. And maybe that's coming from literature through painting. I, I Even my relationship to painting, I think was very idea oriented. I was never in love with the smell or the touch or the, I, I, I wanted to see an image. So it's, it's the image that means something to me. And of course, the material is related to how the image looks, but it's not the driving force. God, my answers are so long. No, they're perfect. <laughs> All right, our next question is from Blaze. Um, they said, it seems a lot of your work revolves around exposing and blurring the lines between what is real and or reflected. I have been hearing the question, is the subject the art or is the photograph the art? A lot, I find, I've heard this question a lot. I find this question perplexing, so I'd like to see how you'd respond to it for your own work. Thank you. I'm not even sure I understand that. Do you need uh, me to read it again? <laughs> I mean, I think the image, again, that I'm talking about is, the, is, is what one leaves with. Um, you know, and then the the format or the materials, the vehicle for it. Um, so, you know, they they wind up being married to each other and inseparable. So I'm not sure how, you know, pressing that question is, you know, it, it, um, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the image and the effect of the image. Uh, uh, on on a viewer, the the receiving of it. Um, next is a comment from MB. They said, "Thank you. I see Madrid in your hedge and the layering of realities." And then, let's see. I have a question from Juliet. Um, they said, "Could you talk a little bit about the choice of photographing photographs as opposed to drawing or painting something, then photographing the drawing, or a similar process?" Um, well, photographs are just one of the things you can photograph, you know. And I think I said quite a bit about turning to you know what I call my photographic maquettes or um, test prints, and, you know, when I print them to scale so I could see what something might look like and then make adjustments, you know, to the file. Um, but, and, and it's funny, I, I almost don't have time to be drawing or painting or, although I do think, and I've been saying this since the early eighties when I made my last painting that I, you know, I'll make another painting sometime. It just hasn't happened. Um, I, it, it could happen this evening, but it's very unlikely. <laughs> so I, you know, it's just, I, I accidentally landed in photography. I mean, I could tell you a quick story if we have time. I was teaching in an alternative high school um, while I was going to art school, the Mequon Upper School, which doesn't exist anymore. And um, I had a student teacher from the Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of Arts. And my reward for having a student teacher was to have a free class. And I was, I was still painting then. This was um, in the 70s. And, um, and I decided to take a photography class in the evening. And I started photographing pieces of my paintings, which is 
part of what the question was about. And I, I didn't even think I would like it particularly because I had taken a printmaking course. I see Paula's here, so I'm sorry to say this, but I never had any patience for printmaking. I had had a printmaking class along the way and at just the time and the waiting, which you know now I probably would do much better with when I was a younger person, I felt very impatient with printmaking. And so I actually didn't expect to like photography for the same reason, but something happened and I liked it very much. I had a couple of my students build me a complete dark room in my bedroom. I mean, a full room with a door that closed and I used the nearby bathroom for water. And I had a black and white dark room and I started using the enlarger like a copy machine. I would quickly make a print, um, come out in the studio. I always lived in my studio, um, put it with another image, see that it was too small, run back and make a bigger one, wash it really quickly, dry it with my hair dryer. I mean, it was totally crazy. Um, maybe I got rid of some of the time that way, the time element, but um, I just, it just worked. It, it, there was something about uh, the collecting of images, almost like vocabulary um, that I could have lots of trees and lots of chairs and um, landscapes and moons and whatever else I was thinking about and um, just build up this collection of images that I could be thinking with. And so photography fit that um, somehow perfectly for me. And now I totally forget what the question was. Um, oh, why don't I draw and paint? Was was that it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's just not, it, things just evolve differently. And, you know, it's like following the things that keep you there. The, you know, it's what I was saying earlier, following the things that make you want to get up in the morning and you're already thinking about it and you need to be back at work. So it, it, it's nothing against painting and drawing. And again, I'm you know very open to them reappearing in my, in my life. Um, I have drawn since that time, but I haven't been painting. Um, and this is, this is sort of where the work lives now. This is how it's evolved. Thank you for that. <laughs> that was a, an awesome story. Speaking of Paula, she is next for the comment. <laughs> she said, um, Eileen, I love your installation in the PMA exhibition. Viewers are asked to become aware of the entire room and switch perspective with respect to the rest of that exhibition onto their body and vision as they evaluate illusion and reality as reimagined in your work. Thank you, Paula. That's that's so great. I mean, I, you know, you you don't know. It's been very fascinating hearing um, some response to the work, some non-response. <laughs> There's quite a range, as you can imagine, or not hearing the non-response. Um, but it's it's you know you you do you know what you can. But it but you know I I really appreciate your your read and um you know it's 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 again sort of a modest interventions but they're all very considered and um i think you do feel a sense of the the both mike and i thinking about the space and how we'll activate it in the installation and the fact that we're set off a bit from the rest of the work i think helps us so we were very lucky in that sense. Um, and even David Hart's work, like on the side of ours, while it's quite different, is, is mannered in a way that suits ours as well. So it all worked out really well. And I, I really appreciate your comment. Thank you. It's great to see you. Beautiful. Our 
next questions from Jill. We'll comment and question. She said, Eileen, thank you for this wonderful presentation. It seems that there are endless possibilities with where your work can go, and I appreciate being able to see all of your simultaneous journeys. Your work gets me excited about more work. How do you decide when to stop or rather take a pause with a piece? Oh, that's, you know, that's hard to say. Um, I, you know, you look for a feeling of, you know, that's, that's right, or that that's, that's good, and then turn to something else. And I don't know, you know, how else to address that. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm in a new situation with um, uh, the work that I'm, I'm trying to organize now for the exhibition I mentioned. I've been very lucky on some fronts, as I said, and have had, you know, gallery representation one way or another uh, for many years, not forever, but long enough that I'm very grateful for it. And um, which means that every two or three years, I've been able to have an exhibition, which is kind of standard gallery turnover time. And um, you know, so bodies of work have evolved in relation to that and the editing, you know, had like a natural frame. This time, um, it's been over five years since the gallery's been closed. I've been working all that time, but in, in a very like responding to this, responding to that, a kind of, you know, my solstice work, other work. Uh, older work, revisited, just on and on, all kinds of projects going on, and trying to understand what I want to bring forward now and, and uh, present in a relatively cohesive way um, has been really daunting. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the strangest thing is I find that I keep making new work. And I think it's like an avoidance mechanism. <laughs> like I, I keep I keep seeing something and making a new piece instead of trying to um, organize and edit through and pull forward the work that I want to see soon. And I and production takes a while, and I really need to solve this problem very shortly. And thank you for all listening to my problems. <laughs> But this is sort of where my head is at the moment. And it, it has, it, I've never been quite in this situation. Of course, I don't want to be silly. This should always be my biggest problem. And I wish you all to have this problem. It's not really a problem. It's just what I'm trying to work out at the moment. Um, again, I can't remember where that started, but... Um, that's where my uh, thinking is at, at this time. I think you answered it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so Jill is our last question. So um, if anyone has any other questions, um, I'll give you guys a minute to put them in. But um, if anyone doesn't have any additional questions, this will conclude our program today. So once again, thank you for all for attending this week's Visiting Artists Program Lecture with Eileen. And we hope that you enjoyed today's lecture. And we look forward to seeing you again for our next artist on July 14th, Lauren Francis Adams. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their night. Thank you all. Beautiful. So Eileen, as people start to trickle out, you can stay. Stay in the room with us. Sure. <laughs> hi, Bashak. What'd you say? I said hi, Bashak. <laughs> <laughs>to say I really I really loved listening to your lecture because I feel like I've talked to you so much but I've never actually like heard you explain and you know thoroughly go through your work so that was that was really exciting to oh I'm glad I'm glad you be unfolding thank you, thank you.
It's fun. I mean, I, you know, my head is really where I was describing it. So um, it, it was fun to just think out loud about things. So I, you know, appreciate having this, um, having some listeners. <laughs> if anyone has any great ideas for me, please send them along. <laughs> well, I, you know, before I even saw your work, I had gone to the Natural History Museum myself for some R and D, and so. Who's speaking? I, hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. It's Christy. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, yeah, I have to change my screen. I could stop sharing. That would help. <laughs> yeah, and then you can see. Hello, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> That was great that you went. You told me that, Christy. Yeah, so after seeing this, I'm like, oh, we could have had a totally different conversation because where it took my brain. Um, yeah, but then we, I'm doing, sorry. Well, well, we would have been talking about me and not you. So oh, that, well, I think you could. we could have like had a good time. Oh, oh yeah, maybe we should get coffee. If 